Please take your Bibles. Turn with me to Hebrews. Is that a surprise? Chapter 4. The fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse 14. If you're here tonight and you do not yet know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to warn you right up front, this message is primarily for believers. But that does not mean that you cannot receive Christ tonight. If you're already under conviction, if the Holy Spirit is teaching you that you are a sinner and you cannot save yourself, if the Holy Spirit is teaching you that Jesus Christ is your only hope for eternal life, that He's the only one can make you right with God the Father, and if the Holy Spirit is teaching you that there is a day of judgment coming where everyone will stand before God, and those who do not know Him will be separated from God eternally, that you will not go to heaven if you do not know Jesus Christ personally. So even though the Word of God is going to be for believers primarily tonight, the Holy Spirit can still use that same word to bring conviction in your heart. And I would ask you, if the Holy Spirit is working on your heart, that you yield to Him and come receive Christ. Now for believers, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now we've talked about that great high priest. Give me just a moment here. Our great high priest is full of mercy and faithfulness. He meets the two criteria to be an effective high priest. He passed the three tests. that God set before him. He became a man. He lived without sin. He was perfected by sufferings. He was appointed by God as high priest after the order of Melchizedek with an oath from God that says, I'll make you high priest for eternity. We saw that he differs from the Old Testament high priest in at least five ways. We've seen that he was both the first goat and the second goat. His blood was shed for our sins. His body was the sin bearer that not only were we forgiven our sins, but our sins were removed, and He is our propitiation. And we saw four things that the Lord is doing even this moment in heaven. He is our great high priest, He's passed through the heavens. His name is Jesus, the Son of God. But I want you to focus in on the next two words. They're short words. Three letters. Two letters. Let us. If there's ever a time in the history of the United States of America when these two words were desperately needed, it's today. It's talking to believers. Let us. Unfortunately, in our nation, we have grown up with the teaching, and it's a good teaching. It's not a biblical teaching, but it's a good teaching. It's the teaching that because I'm an American, I have rights. And everything in America deals with the individual. I have my rights. You have your rights. But in the kingdom of God, we accept Christ individually. But when you receive Christ, you become family. 
When you receive Christ, you become part of God's kingdom. And in the kingdom, it's the king who is king, not the people who are kings. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he has every right to our commitment to him and our commitment to one another because he saved you to function within the family. There's no place for the Lone Ranger in Christianity. There's no place for the soloist in Christianity. We are all to be part of the choir. We're all to be the people of God who take the marching orders of God and take the Great Commission. And so we need to realize that the Word of God says, let us do what? Let us hold fast our confession. We won't take time to turn there now, but if you were were to read in chapter 10, you would find that these believers, many of them had been persecuted. Many of them had lost their homes because of persecution. Many had lost their jobs because of persecution. Many had been thrown into prisons because of their persecution. But in spite of the terrible times that they went through, the Word of God teaches that they were to bind together and never stop professing Jesus as Lord. We're living in a nation that increasingly is saying that we don't like Christians. Christians are politically incorrect. In fact, three of the most incorrect statements you could ever make are these three. You're a sinner. That is politically incorrect, but it's spiritually a fact. Jesus is the only one who can save you. That is spirits, that is politically incorrect, but it is spiritually a fact. Right? And if people die without Jesus, they're going to hell. That is politically incorrect, but it is spiritually a fact. Now, increasingly, things are happening in our nation that make it so that we Christians are basically told it's all right to be a Christian if you'll just keep it inside your church building if you just won't say anything in public. But if you take a public stand for Jesus Christ, there are those who will try to shame you, they'll try to use peer pressure to put you down, and they'll do anything they can to stop you. And quite frankly, some of them hate Christians. You know what we're supposed to do back to them? Love them. Love our enemies. Do good to those who hurt us. Bless those who curse us. Pray for those who spitefully use us. And never back down standing up for Jesus. Let us hold fast that public profession of our faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world, Jesus Christ is King of Kings. And we must be vocal and public and loving. So he says... Since we have such a great high priest, let us hold fast our confession, our public profession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, and there's the second time, 
the second let us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. COVID has done great damage to churches all across our nation. All across the world, but all across our nation. Churches have been operating far less than half capacity. Churches have been dwindling. One of the sad things about COVID comes from something that was good. It was really good that we got to put our services online. It was really good that we started putting those online so people at home could hear the Word of God and see the worship. And that's a great thing. But I'm having pastors tell me as I go to churches, I can't get my people to come back to the house of God. They've gotten so used to watching on TV that they're not coming back to the house of God. And I want you to know something. Those who cannot come back, I totally understand. Those who have such underlying health problems that COVID could just destroy their lives, I totally understand. But quite frankly, a lot of folks can come back that aren't coming back. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to love them. We're going to pray for them. We're going to go to them. And we're going to use these two words. Let us. We need you. You're part of the body. You need the body. Let us. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Now, the Lord let me start this ministry 16 years ago. And in the first 15 years, I never had a single church request that I do a conference on prayer. I did three or four conferences on prayer because I suggested it to churches. But I did not have a single church request a conference on prayer. This year, I've had six churches request a conference on prayer. Why? The times are tough. Our churches, many of them, are not in the good condition that this church is in. Many of our churches are barely making it. Satan is fighting so hard against the churches. And what's going to change that? Prayer is going to change that. We have to come boldly to the throne of grace in every time of need and realize we have a great high priest in heaven who's interceding for us and he is the head of the church and he loves his church and he will bless his church and he will empower his church. But we need to be praying for our churches. Go with me to chapter 10. Verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, isn't that a great? When you pray, your spirit, your words go all the way to the third heaven. Now, the first heavens where the birds fly in the heavens. The second heaven, that's where the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, all the multiple galaxies, and every time we get a bigger microscope, we find there's more out there because when God creates, He does it good. And He made it all. 
But there is a third heaven that is not in the realm of creation. It was in existence by the hand of God before the world was ever created. It is in a totally different dimension of existence. The third heaven. And when you utter a prayer, instantaneously, no lapse, no gap for time, your prayer as a child of God is heard at the throne of mercy in heaven and your high priest hears it. Now, there are over 6 billion people on this planet, and if 6 billion people all prayed at the same time, at the very same moment, all 6 billion prayers could get to God, and God would distinguish them. The Lord would know every prayer individually, and He would already know how to answer it before it ever got there. He's God. He's almighty. He's all-powerful. Wow having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which is consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the household of God, over the families of God, let us, there's the third use, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. God not only wants you to be saved, He wants you to know you're saved. But God not only wants you to be saved, and not only does He want you to know you're saved and have full assurance, He wants you drawing near to Him. There is a place of quiet rest dear to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before you near to the heart of God. And when you spend time in the Word, and when you spend time in prayer, and when you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, you can get near to God. And folks, we need churches full of people who stay near to God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now this is very similar to the first let us. The first let us was let's hold fast to our public profession but this one is, let us hold fast to our profession of hope. Love that word, hope. In the Bible, hope is never a wish. Hope is never a pipe dream. Hope is never a fantasy. Hope is that firm assurance that Jesus Christ will come again one day as our blessed hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, and our hope one day will return. And Hebrews chapter 6 says, our hope is like an anchor of the soul. It's like one end of the anchor is anchored in heaven, and the other end of the anchor is anchored in your spirit and your soul. And the older you get, and the closer you come to death, the closer you're getting to heaven. And when you die, you're going to be taken immediately to be with the Father. And hope can get you through anything. 
it's those who are without God who are without hope. But anybody that has Jesus as Savior, anybody that has Jesus as great high priest, our hope is secure. Amen? And we need to let the world know everything is not hopeless. Man can never fix this place. But praise God, Jesus will. We have hope. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up. In the King James Version, it says to provoke. Have you ever provoked anybody? Yeah? To provoke one another to love and good works. Now that means God is not satisfied just if I love people. God is not satisfied just as I, if I do good works. God is not satisfied if you love people and do good works. He wants you and me stirring up other people to join us and love people together and do good works together because it's let us. You know, in a marriage, that's part of what a marriage is. Husband and wife that love the Lord and they stir each other up to do good works that please God. That's what it ought to be. And so it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Why were they not meeting together in those days? Persecution. And God's Word says, don't quit meeting together in times of persecution. Keep on meeting together. We need to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. And being with God's people as we meet to worship God is essential for our testimony in a lost and dying world. So not forsaking the assembling is another let us. Let us not forsake. The assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some is, but encouraging one another, exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but till then, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Go with me, if you will, to chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, like all those Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now, I'm not asking for public confession right now. I just want you to be honest with yourself for a moment. There are certain sins that never tempt you. Isn't that right? Some people are tempted to certain sins that you're not. Right? But there are certain sins that do tempt you. And not everybody's going to be tempted by those same sins. But we all have sins that easily beset us. Do you know what yours are? Sure you do. Unless you're a narcissist. Right? You know what your sins are. Does Satan... Do the demons know what your sins are? Have you ever noticed that when you try to turn away from that sin, 
you start doing real well, and then bam, 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 temptations you hadn't faced anything like in a long time will show up to tempt you to yield to those sins. Isn't that right? How do you lay aside the sin that so easily ensnares you? Some things don't go out without prayer and fasting. And here's another thing you can do. Let's say your sin is um, your anger, your temper. Nobody ever sins with their temper, do they? But if your sin is your temper, wouldn't it be a good thing to study what the Word of God says about anger? And wouldn't it be a good thing to find the verses in Scripture that deal with your kind of anger? And wouldn't it be a good thing to write those verses down and carry those verses with you? And every time that anger starts to come out and you start to feel that adrenaline rush and you start to fall into that sin, you would stop and you would pull out those verses and you would read the Word of God because the Word of God is a sword of the Spirit. And then you would pray and say, God, I need you. You come boldly to the throne of grace in your time of need, and you'll find mercy and grace to help you. But if you don't plan ahead, it will surprise you, and you won't deal with it. And then you will be so miserable that you sinned because it will grieve God's Spirit. Isn't this true? Let us learn how to lay aside the sin that so easily ensnares us. And another let us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had a race to run. He had to leave heaven, become a man. He had to live a sinless life. He had to be perfected through sufferings. He had to die and bear our sins on the cross. He had to rise from the dead and conquer death and hell and Satan. And he had to go back to the Father to complete that race. Well, he's given you a race. Your race is the life that God desires you to live this side of heaven. And every one of us are called to run with perseverance and run with endurance the race that's set before us. You say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Let me tell you. First thing you're supposed to do is get into the Word of God and start learning how to pray and start learning how to become like Jesus. And if you'll do that, the Holy Spirit will start telling you what to do. And you'll know what race to run. Now, you won't know what you're going to be running next year Because we walk by faith, not by sight, and he'll show you every day where the race is going to turn. But you walk by faith. So let us run with endurance, just like Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, and let's do it for the same reasons he did, for the joy that was set before him. What was joy? that joy? Twofold. The joy of hearing the Father say, Well done. You did what I sent you to do. Don't you want God to say that to you when you enter into heaven? Well done. And Jesus did it first for the joy of pleasing the Father. That's why he goes to the cross. But there's a second reason he goes to the cross. 
Because He loves us. And if you want to hear the Father say, well done, then love people and get involved in the harvest of the gospel. You can prepare the soil, you can plant some seed, you can water some seed, and if God so ordains it, you can even reap the harvest. But that's where we get our joy. I'll tell you another place we get our joy. John says over in 2 and 3 John, I have no greater joy than this than to see that my children are walking in the truth. And when I get to heaven, I want to see my children, my grandchildren there. And I want to know that they ran their race. Don't you? Yeah. Wow. Look at chapter 12. Look down at verse 28. Chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, (laughs) this old world is going to be shaken. When God came down on Mount Sinai, the mountain shook and they were all afraid. And they said, Moses, we don't want to talk to God. (laughs) Everything's shaking too much here. It's all going to fall apart. You go talk to God for us. And he did. But it tells us that when the end times come, this world is going to be shaken. It will not be destroyed by water. It will be destroyed by fire. And the elements will melt with a fervent heat. And the whole world will be shaken and destroyed. And folks... Where do lost people have to go when the world is destroyed? But we, on the other hand, we're part of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom will never be shaken. And in God's kingdom, there's a new heavens and a new earth. And we've got the place to go. So because of this, Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Is God a God of love? Absolutely. Is God a God of judgment? Absolutely. Is His judgment just? Absolutely. But I want you to know this. When you come into the presence of God, He is so awesome. He is so almighty powerful that we would quake in our boots. But He gave us a great high priest so we can draw near in full assurance. But God is not your Santa Claus. God is God. You don't call him the old man upstairs. You treat God with reverence. Go to chapter 13. Let's begin in verse 10. Chapter 13, verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Talking about the priests getting their food from the offerings in the tabernacle and the temple. Our altar's in heaven. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought in the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Do you remember the other night when the priest offered the bull for his own sins? He offered the goat for the sins of the people. And what part of the bull and the goat did they keep to go on the altar? The fat. The rest of the carcass was considered useless. Worthless. 
And so there was a man of readiness who took all the intestines and all the skin and all that wasn't going on the altar and he takes it outside the city away from the camp, away from the group of all of God's people who've gathered to worship and he burns it out there because it's worthless. But read on. It says, Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. Now, are you getting this? When Jesus was put to death, he was not put to death on the bronze altar in the temple. He was not put to death inside the city walls of Jerusalem where all the nation has gathered for Passover. When Jesus was put to death, they took him outside the city walls like he was the worthless leftovers of the sin offerings and that's where they crucified him so that he would be shamed. Now the Romans were shaming him because that was their first intention of crucifixion. But the Jews were shaming him because they were letting him die on a tree to be cursed, and the cursing on a tree could not be done inside the city. It had to be done outside the city. So he's cursed by both the Romans and the Jews and shamed. And then it says this, He suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us, let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Rather, the people of God are the people who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's so easy to talk about serving Jesus when we're inside the church building. We're with all God's people. But we're not called to live inside the church building. We're called to get outside the church building and go outside the camp. And when we go out there, we're called to go out and bear the reproach of Jesus just like He bore the reproach for us. If you're going to walk in the steps of Jesus, then we together have to get outside the grouping of believers who gather to worship, and we've got to go out where the world is and hold our heads high and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I love you, and you need Him too, and there will be those who will hate us. Now, the night before the cross, Jesus said, if there are those in the world, when you go out there, if they hated me, or if they would hate me, they'll hate you. But if they would receive me, they'll receive you. Isn't that interesting? Are you one of those people that you want everybody to like you? I have to confess, I'm the oldest child, five children. One of the common traits of as an oldest child, not every oldest child, but a common trait is you want people to like you. You want to be a people pleaser. I want you to know this. Jesus did not call me to be a people pleaser. He didn't call you to be a people pleaser. He called you to go with the message and let those who will receive us get saved and let those who reject us reproach us for the name of Christ. Let us go outside the camp bearing his reproach quickly. It says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Therefore let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let us be a people of praise. Praise him everywhere you go. I had one fellow in a church, and he had been a pastor, but his wife left him, so he quit being a pastor. 
Great Christian man. Never re- well, he did remarry later. But he's working in a job. And I knew, I'd been told that when he works, whatever time, day of the morning it was, he would be doing one of two things while he was working. He would be whistling or he would be softly singing while he worked. Now, he was always whistling or singing hymns. He started working for a man in Alma that was a member of the church that Mike Franklin used to be in. This guy was in my church, but he worked for a man in Michael's church. And I knew they were doing remodeling over at St. Edward's. And so I had to make some visits there. So I thought I would sneak back and watch him work for a little bit. And I did it on several occasions. And every time I saw him working, this guy was always whistling or singing a hymn. And I asked his boss, what do the other guys think about that? He said, they love it. He said, we're Christians. And we love it that Robert does this that he's always praising God. He didn't do it just on the days he felt good. He did it on the days he felt bad. But he couldn't help but praise. Let us offer up praise to God, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name, but to do good, that too, and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Doing good is a spiritual sacrifice when you get yourself out of the way and you're not doing it for yourself and you do good so that men will glorify God. Then doing good becomes a spiritual sacrifice. Sharing has to do with giving money. It's helping out somebody that has a legitimate need. And one of the interesting things about the sharing passage is, if you will study Philippians chapter 4, the last 10 verses, and if you'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, there is one church that always helped Paul out with money on his missionary journeys. It was the church at Philippi. And the church at Philippi was one of the Macedonian churches. And if you read 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, you're going to find that the churches in Macedonia were poverty-stricken, but Paul says they gave beyond their ability to give. They begged for the, the privilege of giving to a church that was in need, and their giving was a spiritual sacrifice. Wow, that's the last. Let us. How many were there? A bunch. So I want to say this to you. You, as Rye Hill Baptist Church, and the rest of us that are here that are not part of this church, we need to be included too. It's time to unify in the Spirit and say, let us, because we have Jesus, our great high priest, and nothing can separate us from his love. His throne is the throne of mercy and grace. He's there in every time of need. So let us live out these passages in Hebrew. Amen? If you're here tonight and you don't know Him, if the Spirit's convicting Him, you come. Let's stand. We're going to pray. We'll sing. Father, I thank You for the truth of Your Word. I pray, Father. Lord, there was a lot that we talked about tonight. Lord, I pray that Your Holy Spirit 
would put in the minds of each individual believer here, especially those let us things that we individually need to work on. The Lord help us to love one another and encourage one another and work with one another. Lord, bless this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.